Registration for the world's most powerful tech event is now open. The greatest minds, the most powerful brands, the most impactful technology, it's all culminating at CES 2024. Discover the tech defining AI, transportation, startups, smart cities, digital health, and solutions for a better, more sustainable planet. Register now at ces.tech. All together, all in, all on. This is CES Tech Talk. I'm James Kotecki. The world's most powerful tech event, CES 2024, brings the future to Las Vegas, January 9th through 12th. Today, we preview the future of fun on the water. Tomorrow's aquatic adventures will be increasingly autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. At least that's the vision from boatmaker Brunswick. And joining me now to unpack what that vision means for your next vacation and the broader boating world is Brunswick CEO, David Folks. David, welcome to the show. Hello, James. Nice to be here. Thank you. So I love this concept, this ACES concept, autonomy, connectivity, electrification, and shared access. I assume as a CEO, it makes it easy for you to communicate the vision to your team, but obviously it also makes it really easy to communicate the vision externally. So I'd love to kind of go through each part of this ACES framework and explain in more detail and understand kind of what these things mean, um, starting with autonomy. And I, I saw this article recently about uh, competitive boat docking, which implies that boat docking is a skill that is is difficult for many regular people. Is that a part of what the future of boating means is autonomous docking? I think it's part of it. I think ACES is, uh, serves very well because it references other verticals as well, particularly automotive. So I think there's an inherent kind of familiarity about the concepts, but the applications in boating are a bit uh, different. I think, you know, notably on the autonomy side, as you look at uh, what's happening in, in passenger vehicles, the kind of movement is really beyond a kind of driver augmentation, really removing the driver from the driving experience. And that is not what we want to do in recreational boating. Uh, operating the boat is part of the experience, mm -hmm. part of what people really enjoy. So what we're trying to do is pick those kind of pain points in boating, the most stressful points, the points that might be a deterrent for a a new boater and even uh, you know, generate some stress in the more experienced boater. And one of those is certainly uh, docking. If you're docking a large boat, there's a lot of momentum. There can be wind and waves and uh, current. There can be a lot of people watching. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it's, it can be an intimidating uh, experience uh, for some people. So we focused our work on autonomy on that docking experience. And we're really, we're using uh, tech that is um, somewhat familiar from automotive, a lot of uh, stereo cameras uh, around the periphery of the boat to sense the environment and interpret the environment. It is a much less structured environment than you find in automotive. If you, I mean, the parking analogy, I think, is a pretty good one for automotive. But most parking spots are fairly well delineated. You know, there are white lines either side or there are two cars um, defining the parking spot. Um, docks are not quite so well defined. They can be a lot of different things. They can be a seawall. They can be a purpose-built dock. So we need a lot of AI to um, interpret what is a dock and what isn't a dock, what is a something that you can safely, you know, bring the boat up against. So that that is... Um, you know, some, some of the differences, a lot of inertia and wind and waves and current in this relatively unstructured environment make the docking experience for an individual, right. um, you know, sometimes a challenge. And, and then it also challenges the technology as well. And I, it, you're referencing it, but another way the analogy kind of breaks down is that when you're in a parking lot, it's not a, a fluid surface, right? So is there, yes. without getting too much into the, into the technology, into, you know, without getting too much into the weeds, but I do want to talk about the technology, I, is there a different kind of technology that's able to, are, are, are you, how are you sensing the movement of the water and how is that being factored into the, the AI decision-making in a literally fluid environment that's changing all the time? Yeah, so you're right. I mean, boats have six degrees of, of freedom. I mean, cars have kind of two and a half degrees of, of freedom, really. They don't go up and down uh, very much. Uh, but boats pitch and roll and heave. Uh, so 
more things to think about. So that's, that's really important when you think about the reference for any sensors. The sensors have to compensate constantly for the fact that the boat is moving and their frame of reference changes constantly. So um, that's an important part of it. It can making the, make the um, overall experience uh, trickier too. The other thing that water does is it reflects light mm. and, and it can um, it can appear as though it's an obstacle. So we have to, um, the, the AI has to be smart enough to uh, continually monitor the, the water, understand if there are reflections coming off it and what they are, and also uh, understand that a wave is not necessarily a, a you know, hard physical obstacle that it needs to avoid. So yeah, a lot of interpretation in there. And so what's the best level of technology for this that's available to consumers today? Can I go and buy a boat from Brunswick right now and just press the auto dock button and it takes care of it? No, no, you can't. Um, but we, we've come a long way with easing the docking experience, but not as far as auto docking. So a lot of big boats now are controlled with a joystick, which is a little bit like a gaming joystick. You can move the boat forwards and backwards and directly sideways and spin it on its uh, axis. And it does that by um, kind of vectoring the thrust from um, the multiple engines that are typically present on a on a modern boat. So we do have quite a lot of um, controllability. We also have um, something that we call Skyhook. That's our name for uh, GPS station keeping. That means that you can uh, press a button and the boat will stay in position and orientation, oh. which is uh, an easy thing for a car, but for a boat when there are wind and waves and current, uh, it's not so easy. So that is a, a function that's readily available. We, we do have autopilot, but it is not a, there's no feedback in the autopilot. It essentially follows a route. Um, and if there was something in the way, then it would hit it. Uh, so okay. you have to constantly be vigilant uh, when you're in autopilot. So those are features that are already available and part of the building blocks for what we're doing right now. Uh, but but uh, this uh, system that we're currently developing for introduction in 2025 will be the first time when you can literally press a button uh, oh. while you're standing off a dock at some distance away and it will dock itself. The other thing, of course, with a boat is there are things above the water and things below the water. <laughs> and uh, we have to think about um, typically cameras above the water, although we've tested LIDAR as well. And then we have to think about sonar uh, beneath the water. These being different kinds of sensors that send out signals and ping the object and then bring the signal back to the sensor on the boat. And then that kind of t tells you how far away that thing is from the boat. That's exactly right. So mm -hmm. in the case of sonar, um, it uses a different frequency in the, in the radio frequency spectrum because light gets refracted and bent underwater. Um, but um, these different frequency waves uh, give you a reliable mm -hmm. feedback on where the object is. Yeah. So it sounds like there's really no technical or conceptual blocker to doing this auto dock that we're talking about. It's simply in development and it's it's going to be coming out soon. Consumers can expect this relatively soon. Yeah, they can expect it soon. I, you know, I would just as with, you know, what we've experienced really with um, autonomy in road vehicles, it's really the last 10% of the mm. what, what are typically called edge cases that really um, kind of dictate the length of the program and the time to market. In our case, it would be, you know, can we interpret all reasonable docks um, as, as a legitimate docking site? Where do we make a cutoff and say that a certain, for example, water conditions or wave conditions, the system should not be used? Yeah. Um, what's the limit of its capability in, say, um, heavy rain, um, for example? So... I think all of us who, who have a vehicle, a road vehicle, that's got some kind of um, sensors on it and have ever been in snow, the first message you get is, you know, your sensors obscured so certain functions are not available. Well, those kind of conditions are much more um, prevalent on the water. There's a lot of spray around, you know, that can be rain. Um, so we just need to um, be careful that we um, fully define the envelope of how, the, how and when the system can be used. This is so interesting because I think if, if somebody thought about this for, you know, if someone was hearing about this for the first time, the first 
20 seconds of their thought process would be, well, we have kind of increasingly autonomous cars. Of course, we'll get autonomous boats. And you obviously are working towards that, but there are so many differences between cars and boats when you get down into the details that makes it an interesting technical challenge. So um, appreciate the insight into autonomy there. And we might come back to it as we connect it to these mm-hmm. other uh, framework uh, pieces within ACES. The next being connectivity. So are we talking about connectivity between boats on the water, effectively boats talking to each other? We, we could be, but our primary um, application, we have a, a number of um, in-market applications at the moment that do a variety of tasks, but the most comprehensive really allow you to maintain contact with your boat. So that's between the the captain or the owner, boat owner and the boat, typically as opposed to boat to boat or boat to infrastructure. Hmm. Um, so, uh, and the purposes can be very, it can be security, it can be monitoring the boat, you can geofence, for example, your boat and make sure that, you know, it, it's uh, secured. You can interact, you can understand what um, voltage there is available or charge level in the electrical system, what the level is in the gas tank, all of those kind of things. And you mm-hmm. can also interact um, and, be, uh, for example, switch on features that you would like to be ready when you come to the boat but for example air conditioning or refrigeration those Mm -hmm. kind of things that take uh, some time before they're fully functional you might want to interact and um, initiate them on the boat maybe an hour or so before you get there so those are some of the primary things that we're doing there's a lot of um, kind of educational content though that goes along with that we try and understand what kind of boater you are. We try to offer up things that might help with your boating experience, everything from checklists to kind of how-to um, content. So boaters are, are um, kind of uh, constantly learning, constantly yeah. wanting to do different things, con- constantly wanting to do what they do uh, better. So we try and serve up content as well as kind of functions and features. And is Brunswick primarily serving uh, consumers, because obviously you talk about this connectivity of an individual mm-hmm. being connected to their boat with, 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 I assume, an app or something like that. And you, one can imagine something similar for fleet owners, or if I own a fleet of recreational boats that I'm, mm-hmm. I'm renting out, I want to see what all of their gas levels are, for example. Yes, we, we do do that. We, we um, And we'll get onto this uh, when we talk about the S and ACES, which is shared access. Mm-hmm. We do operate fleets of boats, and, and we do supply engines and boats into other people's fleets and you're exactly right it is often important for fleet operators to understand engine hours um, level in the gas tank uh, whether there are any error codes for example mm-hmm. it, on any of the systems in the boat so we, we offer that um, functionality as well and it's an important yeah. uh, part of the functionality for a fleet operator certainly when you talk about the data that you're collecting uh, from boat users to kind of mm-hmm. understand the kind of boater that they are, um, what are some, are, are there any counterintuitive things that, you know, uh, someone listening to this conversation might not expect uh, would be kind of behaviors of boaters or things that you can learn about boaters from this data? Yeah, you know, we try, we interact with boaters always with the aim of giving them a better experience. And I, I don't know if it's counterintuitive or confirmatory but but i would say that you know as i mentioned earlier boaters never stop learning you know we think of boaters kind of graduating through various levels of um capability um and that is certainly occurs but you know there's never a point when a boater doesn't want to do something better or different from what they've done before and what we found is that um even the most experienced boater enjoys new technology Mm-hmm. Uh, and when they can see value in it, of course, we try and make sure that the technology that we provide adds value for the boater. So when we introduced, for example, joystick control of boats, we were aiming uh, to some extent at the, uh, you know, the, the more uh, kind of junior, the, the less experienced boater who might desire that increased level of control. Uh, but as it turns out now, if, if, if joystick control is available on a boat, it's almost sold on 95% of the boats. Mm. So everybody um, eventually wants that ease and capability. Yeah. And I suppose the uh, the sea always has something new to teach us, right? I'm just, it does. It seems like <laughs> it a, is. a crusty old sea captain <laughs> saying or something, but that's it seems true. No, it is. You know, you're, you're always... Um, 
there there is always a sense i think of a bit of adventure when you go out on a a boat it doesn't you know even i i do a lot of my boating on the great lakes uh which doesn't sound maybe as exciting as doing it on the ocean but in fact the great lakes uh often appear like seas they have a lot of different um you know weather conditions and prevailing uh conditions there's a lot of traffic uh, around so yeah. and it's a very instructed environment uh, you know the, uh, people are operating uh constantly in a vigilant sense of you know, understanding what other people are doing. They've usually got sensors on like radar. Uh, so it, it is a bit more of um, an adventure, if you like, which is part of the appeal, I think, but certainly means that, uh, you know, additional education is constantly helpful. Mm-hmm. Let's get to the E, electrification. Um, increasing autonomy, it is, you know, different from cars on the road, obviously, mm-hmm. but following some of those trends as we're talking about. Connectivity, again, following perhaps or, or leading or just in the mix with some of those trends. We can, you know, manage our cars with an app. We can manage our boats with an app, I suppose. Uh, electrification, should we be thinking about that as also going the same way as our land vehicles? I think we should be thinking about electrification as um, kind of part of the portfolio of solutions that we need uh, to create more sustainable boating. I would say we've introduced our first three uh, models in our lineup of electric outboard uh, motors. Outboard uh, engines power more than 90% of all recreational boats. So outboard is the kind of form factor that we've we've gone after. But they're relatively lower horsepower. Um, Mm. So they tend to be applied to uh, smaller boats with less expectation for high performance and and, uh, less expectation for very long range. And really that's because um, boats require a lot more power um, to to push them along than road vehicles do. Uh, They don't have brakes to regenerate energy and they're very weight sensitive. So if if you think about about a boat a little more like an aircraft than like a um, light duty road vehicle, that's the kind of trade-offs that we're looking at or just like an aircraft they're very weight sensitive so um heavy batteries are um problematic they yeah. require more power just like an aircraft and they don't have brakes um or at least not in the air mm-hmm. um so uh, a bit like an aircraft so electrification is slowly coming into boating mostly in europe and to some extent driven by regulation uh, some mm-hmm. lakes in Europe and some waterways in Europe uh, are uh, restricted for internal combustion engines. So that's where we see the largest application. At the, at the moment, um, boaters are interested generally in electrification, but uh, don't really want to make big trade-offs, uh, right. either in cost or range or performance or anything else. And at the moment for... Um, larger boats, there is a pretty significant trade-off. That doesn't mean that over time, you know, some of those barriers will not be overcome. And we're certainly expecting to be on the leading edge of that. But at the moment, uh, we're kind of playing in the area with electrification where we think we have the best opportunity for customer satisfaction and the best opportunity for, for success, which at the moment is in smaller vessels. One thing that we are doing, though, is at larger vessels... Um, Obviously, they have propulsion engines, but they typically have a combustion engine generator on board that powers all of what we call the house system. So that would be air conditioning, sure. uh, refrigeration, the onboard electronics, infotainment type systems. And we are progressively replacing those onboard uh, combustion engine generators with high capacity lithium ion battery systems. We have a system that we call Fathom which is a combination of um, uh, lithium-ion batteries that we produce in our uh, our brand MasterVolt with a power management system that attaches that um, battery to all of the the electrical systems on the boat. A battery gets recharged by a 48-volt alternator on the engine. So that is Mm -hmm. something that we can do for larger boats um, where we can't directly replace the propulsion engines. And, and, and when it comes to propulsion, do you look at things, uh, you imagine things like hybrids where, you know, you're using electricity in the harbor maybe to cut down on emissions. And then when you get out on the open water, you give it the gas. 
Uh, to some extent, uh, I think the um, you know the the if you think about, I mean, obviously, if you're looking at CO two, it's not really a harbor versus not in the harbor. Harbor CO two is a is a global issue as opposed to a local issue. If you look at more of the local regulated emissions that really initially kind of came out of CARB and then through EPA like hydrocarbons and um, nitrous oxides and and CO. Uh, of course, it's better if you don't generate those in the harbor, but it's it typically there are wind and waves and, and currents, so you don't get really high concentrations mm. of some of those other emissions components. The so the you know typically the the trade off with the um, hybrid really is. Um, if you put a battery and electric motor on a boat to, for use in the harbor, it is weight that you always have to carry. Ah. So it makes the boat less efficient <laughs> uh, when it's out of the harbor. Uh, so it depends how you prioritize things. Well, if you insist on the boat having zero emissions in the harbor, then you can use a hybrid to achieve that. But you have to recognize that once it's out of the harbor, it's actually going to generate more CO2 emissions <laughs> because it's pushing a heavier load <laughs> because of the weight of the batteries and the weight of the motors. So it's a little bit of a, yeah. how do you prioritize you know, some of the attributes? Yeah, a lot of interesting trade-offs here. Yeah. And uh, the, the final uh, piece of the ACES framework is shared access. We touched on it a bit before, but can you give me some numbers to help us understand the scope of this? So people individually might want to own boats, but then there's hopefully you know a larger, not hopefully for you, uh, a larger segment of people that, that don't want to own boats, but want to be able to have this experience and, and rent them in some way or, or have this kind of shared access. So can you scope this out for us? Yeah. So um, we own uh, a boat club called Freedom Boat Club, which is the by far the largest boat club in the world. And it operates like any other club, really. There's an initiation fee and then you pay monthly dues. And and for that, you get access to a fleet of um, new boats, kind of one to three years old. Um, you book them on an app. Um, when you arrive at the location, they're ready for you to use. And when you finish, you drop them off. So it's uh, extremely uh, convenient for a lot of people, especially in metropolitan areas. You don't need to think about service or maintenance yeah. or, or the, you know, the principal investment or storing them over the winter or any of those things. We do all that for you. There are about 400 Freedom locations worldwide now, all with a fleet of uh, boats. We have um, the majority in the U.S., uh, but we have um, about 15 or 20 locations in Canada, 40 in Europe. We've just opened the first uh, six locations in Sydney, Australia. Hmm. And if you're a member of Freedom at one location, then you can boat at all the locations. So, Hence the name, right? Yes. It is very <laughs> um, attractive for those people who, uh, for, yes, say, for example, you, you live in New York, but you go on vacation to Florida, or maybe you go on vacation to Spain or whatever it is, wherever, wherever it is, pretty much, we have a a boat club for you. So there's um, about 400 locations and about 5,000 boats in the Freedom fleet. And we have uh, close to um, about 100,000 members now. now. If you think of that in terms of scale, um, there are about 200,000 new boats sold every year. So that's the kind of scale of new boat purchases in a year, but Freedom has 100,000 members. So Freedom is genuinely a pretty significant scale uh, in the industry, and it's growing extremely quickly. So I think people are very attracted to the convenience of the model, the variety of boats that they have access to. Um, and we're very excited about mm -hmm. the growth of that model. You know, it, it also allows us to do to experiment, if you like, uh, with introducing some of the other ACES content that we mentioned earlier. Mm. So, for example, we can introduce electric boats uh, into the Freedom Fleet, uh, where they can be centrally managed, so the individuals don't have to worry about, you know, batteries or recharging right. and all those kind of things that they might have to worry about otherwise. So, we see um, Sh Freedom boat club and shared access is a very valid alternative way to participate in boating. We're very excited about it. And also an enabler for some of the other ACES uh, technologies. Yeah. 
And as we bring uh, this entire ACES framework together and we think about a Freedom Book Club member heading down to the marina in a few years' time as they are continually getting kind of new boats into the mix down there, do, do you see from a design perspective boats continuing to basically still look like boats as we can imagine them? Sure, they're more electric and sleeker and shinier, but they basically still look like boats. Could, could we be expecting from a consumer perspective things that look somewhat radically different from what we're used to? How far will this go from an optics perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, it's definitely possible that some of those things will happen. I, I, you know, there are some fundamentals. I mean, I think, you know, aircraft have evolved a long way, and I used that analogy earlier, but you can still tell, you know, World War II aircraft <laughs> and a current yeah. aircraft share, share, you know, wings and a tail and, and yeah. a fuselage. And those kind of things, but certainly a lot of the technologies on board have changed very, very substantially on the on the propulsion side. Certainly, to some extent on the hydrodynamics. Um, and once again, there's a bit of a trade off there. Uh, we recently acquired a company called Flight, uh, which is a, a kind of a foiling electric foiling surfboard company. So you, I don't know if you've seen any of this, these things, but essentially. Um, it's, it looks like a surfboard. There's an electric motor under the water on a mast, and it's, it allows you to kind of float above the the, mm. the water on this electric surfboard. So that um, foiling technology uh, is interesting to us. I think it's not quite clear what the full extent of the applications could be. It offers efficiency in some applications, it's not quite as um, flexible in others. So we could see um, a little more of a foiling technology come in, which would make the boats look somewhat different. Um, you know, I would say, though, if you if you look at boats in general, they've evolved quite a lot. One of the things that um, is interesting about boats is they last a long time. So uh, fiberglass boats in particular, you know, could easily yeah. be around for 30 years. So if you go to a typical marina, uh, you're not necessarily necessarily seeing the latest technology. You might be seeing a spread of 30 years of technology, um, but but actually the design of boats have, have uh, evolved quite a lot over that time. Two more questions before we let you go. The first is, I know that Brunswick is uh, prioritizing getting more women involved in boating. So mm -hmm. can you give us a sense of why that's important to Brunswick and, and how that's going so far? Yeah, I, you know, broadly, I think diversity is very important to us in all kinds of ways, both internally in the company and um, externally in terms of accessing, you know, as many people who want to get into the boating lifestyle as possible and making sure that people who might not traditionally have been in the uh, boating lifestyle have an opportunity to participate. What we've seen, uh, particularly with the Freedom Model, is about... 35% of Freedom members are women, which is significantly more than the number of women who buy a boat. Now, uh, to be honest, boats typically are family assets, so who actually signs on the dotted line is, is not necessarily representative of who who's participating on the water. But I think generally, um, Freedom has uh, given us a, a, some really interesting new opportunities to engage with a more diverse audience. That can be gender diversity. It can be racial and ethnic diversity as well. But they all tend to be somewhat higher in freedom. So if we can use these alternative entry points to engage a, you know, a broader population, a more diverse population, I think that's only good for us and only good for boating and the yeah. industry overall. As we wrap up here, I want to talk about CES 2024. I got a chance to go to the Brunswick booth at CES 2023. I got to stand on the deck of this beautiful boat and, you know, feel like I was the king of the world. And and now at 2024's CES, my understanding is that you're going to be doing something about the marina of the future. So we've talked about the future of boating. What does the marina of the future look like and how will that show up at CES 2024? Well, yes. So um, Brunswick is... Uh, unique in the industry in that we own 18 different boat brands uh, and a variety of um, marine technology businesses. And so, uh, you know, the the marina concept really is about showing the diversity of the kind of boats that we make, the technology that we can introduce on those boats, and even 
the ACES technologies that we described earlier, uh, including electric boats, including some of those uh, e-foils or e-surfboards. So really what we're trying to show is that there are lots of entry points uh, to get into the on-water lifestyle uh, and boating uh, and uh, lots of technology that is a very equivalent and in some cases even more advanced than some of the uh, technologies that you might be more familiar with if if your main kind of gateway on technology is through automotive or through kind of smart devices. There's some very interesting technology in, in the marine environment that I think we, we're anxious to continue to display. Well, we can't wait to see it. Really appreciate you for being here with us, David Folks, the CEO of Brunswick. Thanks so much for being on CES Tech Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it very much. And that's our show for now, but there's always more tech to talk about. So if you're joining us on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and leave a comment. If you're joining us on Spotify or listening on Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, wherever you get your podcasts, be sure to hit the follow button and you can get even more CES and prepare for Vegas at ces.tech. That's C-E-S dot T-E-C-H. Our show is produced by Nicole Vitovich and Mason Manuel, recorded by Andrew Lynn and edited by Third Spoon. I'm James Kotecki, talking tech on CES Tech Talk. <laughs>